Hello everyone and welcome back to Prestige Reef. It's been a while since the Red Sea Tank has had an update, and every day I get asked when the next one is coming. Today, the wait is over. There are a few things to talk about, including new fish, corals, equipment, and an algae bloom. Let's start with the new equipment. I've been fortunate enough to be able to test out Red Sea's new wave maker since January, although it's been installed on my 1000 litre tank rather than the Red Sea tank. Today is the day I'll be moving it over, but not before giving it a much needed clean, because it's even got coral growing on it. The model I have is the Reef Wave 25, which is rated for 1960 gallons per hour. However, there is the Reef Wave 45 for larger tanks which is rated to 3960 gallons. During its development, Red Sea worked with MaxSpec to create a powerful pump based on their Gyre technology. It's easy to install by simply securing it to the side of the aquarium with the magnet, and each side of the pump is directional and can be rotated up and down. This is a feature I like, as it's allowed me to aim one side up to significantly increase surface agitation, while the other side is directed more towards the corals. It's been designed to be silent using anti-vibration mounts and dual bearings, which are colour coded making it easy to take apart and reassemble in the correct order. The controller is intuitive and it has 5 preset programs which are easy to scroll between, as well as a feed mode and maintenance mode. After that, all you need to do is set the intensity using the wheel, once again sticking to Red Sea's ethos of making everything as simple as possible. It can also be controlled via Wi-Fi using Red Sea's ReefBeat app, making it controllable both remotely and locally. One of my favourite features with the app is that when equipment connected to it loses power, it sends you a notification. This acts as a potential tank crash saving warning system, and I have no doubt will save many tanks. With that now installed, let me give you an update on what's going on with the rest of the tank. I'm starting to see a lot more life in the tank than I expected, considering I started with man-made rock, which combined with what I'm about to tell you next, shows that the tank is starting to mature. It's just coming out of an algae bloom which is completely normal for reasonably new setups. This stage varies with regards to the type of algae and severity, and unfortunately I had a particularly difficult strain of turf algae, which I potentially made worse than it needed to be. It all started when I saw a tang at the fish shop which I've always wanted. This is a Fowleri tang, and it's the first one I've ever seen in person in 12 years. Unfortunately, when I first got her she was pretty skinny. This isn't unusual for acanthorous tangs, which often go on hunger strike when they first adapt to captivity. I set to work trying to fatten her up, and since I'd been in lockdown, I've had the ability to feed her a lot more than usual, which is exactly what I did. That's right, 12 years in the hobby, I made the classic beginner mistake, overfeeding. Every time I walked past the tank, I'd throw in some pellets, and she has started to put on weight again. The unfortunate side effect of this increased feeding schedule was algae growth. For me, algae hasn't ever been something to worry about. I've had it before, and there are numerous ways to get rid of it. Less light, less nutrients, more predators, and manual removal. However, this was different. As I mentioned, this was a particularly tough strain of turf algae, which grows as a mat, and it wasn't even easy for me to get it off the rock. I manually removed as much as I could, and I changed the photo period of the reef LEDs to slow its growth, however it almost immediately grew back. My phosphate and nitrates were already giving a false zero reading, because the algae was utilising them, so I didn't change my dose of nopox, and I set to work on plan B, more cleanup crew. I added two types of snails, more hermit crabs, and several mithrax crabs. Literally, nothing would touch it. On to plan C. Tangs. Now the Red Sea tank already had three tangs in it, but they were small and again they wouldn't eat it. In my 1000 litre tank, I have multiple much larger tangs, which eat a whole range of algae, and I suspected some of them would eat this. I caught my 12 year old purple tang Lola and moved her over. And she wouldn't eat it either. Okay, let's try this again. Those of you that follow me on Instagram will know that I spent hours and hours trying to catch the Scopus Tang, at one point falling off the chair which put me in crutches, before I eventually gave up on it and took the Powder Blue Tang instead. She was my second choice because I was a little concerned she would be aggressive with the other Acanthorus Tangs, but she's been as good as gold. The other issue is she's also quite big, however she's going to be added to the Mega Build once I've finished building it, 
So like most of the other tanks in this tank, their time here is only temporary. It wasn't long before my hopes were dashed a second time, and the powder blue tang wouldn't eat it either. This led me on to plan D, urchins. Although they are part of the cleanup crew, they aren't something I've ever kept previously. I added two Halloween urchins to the tank, and after 10 days of closely watching them, they weren't that interested either. They also came with the unfortunate side effect of knocking over frags, as some of them were only stuck down very loosely. Stumped by this, I messaged one of Red Sea's experts to see what they thought. Now this is not something I recommend doing, and I'm not going to tell you the specifics, as this was done in a very controlled manner, but we ended up gradually overdosing Nopox over a period of time to starve out the algae, while setting the skimmer to produce very wet skimmate. Unfortunately, this method also starves the corals, therefore I had to make sure I was actively target feeding them more as well. What happened next was pretty amazing. After a couple of days, the algae appeared to have become weakened by the lack of nutrients, and suddenly everything would eat it, and it pretty much disappeared in a couple of days. Now that the fish were digesting it, and the nutrients were going back into the water, once again I was starting to get nitrate and phosphate readings on the test kits. What you see in the tank today is the last little tufts of algae which are just about hanging in there. There was one coral which did bleach slightly during this process, however it's already started to come back. The final update for you is with regards to coral placement. I don't have many new corals in here, however I've moved some of them around. The problem with the lockdown is that you're stuck at home with your tank and you want to tweak things you wouldn't normally tweak. I also noticed that my frog spawns were starting to send out sweeper tentacles at night, which were getting a little too close to my Leptosiris. Therefore I decided to relocate them to the left island, and make that island more LPS dominant. It's a shame to remove all the nicely encrusted Montipora, but it was also nice to give some of the LPS a more prominent place in the tank. This Duncan's Coral and Candy Cane were originally tucked down the side of the tank, and it's nice to give them a place that they deserve. The majority of the SPS have now been relocated to the right side, and I actually think they look better now. I hope you enjoyed watching my video, please feel free to comment below if you have any questions. If you did enjoy it, why not click that like button and subscribe to the channel. Have a good week, and I'll see you next time.